Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to part two on these seven categories that will be shaded on judgment today when there is no other shade but Allah and why this is a huge lie that contradicts the Quran 1000%. When will this event take place? And by this I mean when will the sun get closer to humans' head and cause them to sweat? And the reason we ask this question is really simple. Allah in Al-Quran has told us about far less dangerous things that will happen on Judgment Day. For example, he told us about how people will not be able to speak freely on Judgment Day and they will only be able to whisper to each other like when we are uh, if we have a problem and in school and the, the headmaster is standing there threatening people we cannot talk to him but we can whisper amongst each other Allah says in the Quran in the meaning and the voices of humans jinn, shayatin everybody the angels will turn low in front of the Lord so you will hear nothing but whispers that's it Allah tells us about that in another surah in Surah Al-Kahf, for example, he tells us about how people will stand in front of Allah awaiting their accountability. He tells us, and they shall all, all creation, humans and jinn, all line up in a single row before the God. So Allah is at one point in some place and all the creation from the first man to the last man, from the first jinn to the last jinn, we all will be on one single row, shoulder to shoulder, one at your right and one at your left, everybody faced towards where they're gonna go and be held accountable. And this is a very disturbing reality. Look at that. Allah tells us about how people will talk, how we will stand. And I need to mention one thing. If you go to Surah Al-Kahf 18, Ayah 48, Allah says, وَعُرِدُ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ صَفًّا And they shall all be lined up in front of your Lord in one single row. If you go to the English translations, the Quran.com, they will tell you that it is rows, um, um, like plural of row, when the Quran says only one row. And this is one of the problems of the translation. So, and there are other things where Allah talks to us about the rivers in Jannah, about the food of people of her fire, how hot the water is, and he talks to us about how a person cannot die and the punishment, what people People will say the regret, the places, all these things Allah talks to them about them. And he fails to tell us about how a son is going to be created specifically for our punishment on that day. This is crazy. Wallahi, this is crazy. Another thing that's going to make you really worry. When the sheikhs, the men of religion, when they found themselves seven in this hadith seven will be seven categories will be shaded and all that stuff when actually they found other people will be shaded and now they have a problem they say how do we understand this hadith narrative it says seven but now we know there are more than seven well guess what they said they said the number seven in this hadith the number seven they said this number the number seven in this hadith narrative has no meaning to it the seven the number has no meaning to it this number seven that comes after six and before eight has no meaning to it who give these people the authority? This number is known to everybody. How suddenly when it comes into a hadith narrative, which is supposed to be a revelation from Allah, they tell you it has no meaning. It is a meaningless number. It's seven, seven, ya Allah, seven, seven, seven. How can it be? So now the, uh, this gives us a whole bigger problem. If we go the root of these people that anything that the messengers say is a revelation, then when Allah states in this hadith narrative by Bukhari and Muslim and a gazillion of other people that seven categories will be shielded by Allah on the day there is no shade but his shade, when Allah revealed this hadith narrative and it's a revelation, it comes from Allah, it must be authentic already. So did Allah forget the other, the other categories? Or... Did he add other categories later on after he said seven? 
In other words, when Allah said seven, did the other categories exist before and Allah forgot to mention them? Or they didn't exist, but he said seven and later on added other categories? Did he mention the number seven just like that for the joke of it? And this is a huge problem. And this is why when people don't want to accept Islam, when people say, make fun of Islam and tell you this is a joke, this religion is a joke, they're correct. How can they live with seven is a meaningless number? It doesn't have a meaning. Doesn't Allah say that in the in the Allah al Islam, the religion indeed before Allah is Islam? And what Allah wants in his religion is in the Quran and the Quran alone. Because no one can come and tell you, oh, that word in the Quran is meaningless. They can't. No, they tell you every word, every sentence, every letter in the Quran has a purpose. But in the hadith, number seven becomes a meaningless hadith. Another question imposes itself upon us. What if someone fulfilled only one category of these? Let's say somebody uh, was approached by a woman to have sex with him and she was extremely sexy and he said, sorry, I fear Allah. Yup, you've guaranteed your place in the shade, right? No problem. What if next time another woman more beautiful, more tempting came to you and you went ahead with her? Which of the two situations will, will help you? Because if you, if you go with the woman and on judgment day you are not put in that special place, in that special shade, you can turn to Allah and say, hey, I was approached by a woman and I said no. And if he says, oh, you said no, but this time you said yes, I can easily tell him, why did you take the second one and not the first one? What if someone did uh, uh, one and failed in six? A ruler, a just ruler, yeah? He was just ruler, but he failed miserably in the other things. Would that put him in the shade? And of course, all this, the battle rages on between the men of religion on this one. No final ruling on this. Each scholar, each sheikh, each school of thought, each this has an opinion and each one of them preaches to their heart's content. None of them respects the Quran. Is another hadith narrative which they call Qudsi. Qudsi is sanctified hadith. What they say is this. The Quran is revealed from Allah, words and meanings from Allah to the messenger. Okay. As for the hadith narrative, they say the meaning is from Allah, but the wordings are from the messenger. Okay. The sanctified hadith or the hadith Qudsi is the word, the, the meanings is from Allah and the wordings are from Allah, but spoken through the messenger. So it's, it's not Allah. Allah who says them, but it is the messenger who said them. Of course, you will scratch your head, what's the difference between that and the Quran, but that's what it is. But however, when you look at the text in Islam, only the Quran is mentioned as Kalamullah, the words of Allah, the speech of Allah. Anything else is the messenger of Allah said. They can't call the Hadith Qudsi, the sanctified Hadith, as the words of Allah. They can't. And that's why they say they gave this title of Hadith Qudsi. So there is a Hadith Qudsi that states that, the mess that God, Allah said, those who love each other, in my majesty shall be in the shade of my throne on a day where there would be no other shade except mine. And this hadith is as dangerous as it is. It's in Ahmed. Ahmed is, uh, is the teacher of Bukhari, Muslim and things like that. Al-Bukhari, Malik, Muslim, and even an authenticated by Al-Albani. The question is, in this hadith narrative, it clearly mentions in the shade of my throne. Why are the sheikhs then differentiating and fighting what kind of shade it is? We've got here, it clearly says the shade of my throne. Yet, in another of these so-called hadith Qudsi, the sanctified hadith, things like that, it states that on judgment day, Allah will say, where are those who love one another through my majesty or my glory? Today I shall give them a shade in my shade. It being a day when there is no shade but my shade. No mention whatsoever. And this hadith is reported by Ahmed, Bukhari, Malik, Muslim. Same bunch of people. But he doesn't mention the throne. 
So if we take the root of Ahmed Didat, who used to pound the, the Christians on the Bible, this version says this, that version says that, this version says this, that version says that, the Bible is wrong. We have the same problem in these hadith narratives. We have a hadith narrative that says this, and the same hadith narrative with the same degree of authenticity says the same thing, but no in my throne. If they have removed in my throne. So the problem, my dear sisters and my brothers and my sisters and things like that, the whole thing is a lie, contradicts the Quran, hundred, as I said, percent. Let's look briefly about, well, let's scrutinize uh, those seven categories a little bit just to have an idea, yeah? So when he says a just ruler, what makes a just ruler? Who decides on what makes a just ruler? What should such a ruler do to be qualified as just? Because as we know it, a ruler is one person and a country is 40 million. How, how can he be just? What, he, what does such a ruler have to do to be qualified as just? Who decides on that? Who decides on the performance? The, the, who measures the performance? Does the ruler, of course, the sheikh, they say a ruler is a king and things like that. But others, they say, no, 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 no. The ruler means any person who is in a position of authority. Of course, then the question comes in, this ruler, a father, they say, yeah, the father is a ruler of the family. A mother, yeah, the mother is a ruler of the family. A manager at work, he's a ruler. A head of a company, he's a ruler. <laughs> a bus driver, he's a ruler because he rules the bus. So then again, everybody qualifies as a ruler, right? But the problem is the sheikhs don't, uh, don't look into these things as they ought. Let's go to point number two. A youth who grew up in the worship of his or their Lord. So now the youth must start early in their lives, right, to qualify for this uh, place, for this treatment, for this uh, uh, exemption. So now the problem is, what age should such youth start? What if a youth in the first months of their youth messes a big deal and then catches up later on and repents? Because the hadith states, a youth who grew up in the worship of their Lord. Two men who love each other for Allah's sake. They meet upon that and they part away from each other on that. This is a very difficult thing to get your head around. How can you love someone for the sake of someone else? Why don't you love them for the, who they are, for that person there? When we fall in love with a partner, but it's either we love them, we fall in love with them, or we fall in love with them because of Allah. How, how, does, that, how does that work? What if the other man isn't from the same school of thought? Because Salafis will not fall in love. They will not love another man for the sake of Allah. They hate it. Why? Because he's not part of their school of thought. Maliki, Shafi, the different school of thoughts for 1400 years. And the talk is on my YouTube channel, how I put... 1400 years if my memory serves me well under an hour and the, and the amount of animosity between this school of thoughts is incredible so now the question is two men who love each other for the sake of Allah define the sake of Allah because to the Salafis someone to qualify as the sake of Allah must fulfill all the requirements of the Salafis themselves I'll give you a couple examples yeah At-Tabari At-Tabari is considered like the great sheikh of tafsir in the Muslim world that the respect than everything. He was killed by the Hanbali. The Hanbali is what's in Saudi Arabia today, the Salafis. Tabari was killed by these people. He was stoned to death. A Shafi was also killed by someone else of another school of thought and so on and so forth. So what defines loving someone for the sake of Allah? I, I, I don't know how to love you for the sake of Allah. Well, I don't know. Many times before, you would see a sheikh or someone who comes to and gives a talk, and then at the moment he sits down, he looks at the people in the masjid, and he tells them, I love you for the sake of Allah. And they say, oh, we love you for the sake of Allah. None of them loves each other, and they lie about that. So I, one time I asked the sheikh, I said, what do you mean by that? And of course the conversation went, and it never was about that lot. I'll jump on to the next one. A man who is invited by a woman of beauty and attraction to have illegal sex and he says, no, I fear Allah. What about the woman? 
Who is called by a man who is beautiful and strong and rich and powerful to have sex with him? <laughs> oh no, I fear Allah. Why doesn't it apply to women? And why is it always a woman, a man who is invited by a woman? There is a hadith in Al-Bukhari where the messenger of Allah asks a woman to offer herself to him. And it's on my website, please, uh, sorry, on YouTube channel. Please go there. When he told her, give yourself to me. And she told him, I don't give myself to you. You are just a peasant. Now why should I, a peasant, why should I give myself to you? As usual, as usual, the men of religion are keen on making women the trigger for sex. It's not men, it's women. It's always women. The Arabs who live in the desert, who are covered in dust, they are sweaty, stinking. And the woman of beautiful and power would call them to have sex with her? Let me tell you something. If you are not a male, you are a woman. Let me tell you something about us men. If a woman calls a man and she's beauty and extremely thinks like that, already, for, uh, for sex... And he says, I fear Allah, we would think he's crazy. Allah al would say, what? She called you and you said, yeah, he goes to sleep with her and then repent to Allah. Allah accepts repentance. What's the problem with this? Yeah, but, but the hadith, but you know, that's the point number, next point, a man who gives charity and hides it in such manner that his right hand doesn't know what his left hand or things like that. Allah states in Al-Quran, in tubdu sadaqat fani'immahi, if you display your charities, that is excellent. If you do, when you, when you give money in front of the people, that's good, that's fine, no problem. Wa in tukhfuha wa tu'tuha al-fuqara, and if you conceal it and hand it over to the poor, between you and them, he guess that's better for you. So Allah, for Allah, it doesn't matter if you donate your charity in the open or in the close, as long as you donate it. So if on judgment day he will put anyone that has donated with his right hand so that his left hand doesn't know, I will say, Ya Allah, you said in the Quran that it's fine. Why are you treating them better than anyone else? But you know, a man who remembers Allah in private and sheds tears about that. The act of remembering, the verb remembering, oftentimes comes after you forget something. You need to forget to be able to remember. So if, if a man, and notice sexism here, a man, not a woman, a man, sits at home and just thinks of, about Allah, 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 until he drives himself to tears, and it's simple and easy. Link Allah to anything, to how your son died, to how you did, and we are emotional creatures. So the question here is this. One I what if someone sits to remember Allah, but can't cry? Tears do not come easy to them. They are not used to these things. What kind of emotion such a man needs to develop to be able to shed tears? You see, if I sit here to remember my son who died a couple years ago, tears will come to me quick. Why? Because I will remember the day he was born, when he was baby, as I held him in my arm, as I remember the very first time he walked, he spoke, as he grew old, the, the, his smiles. I, I have a lot of emotions I can lean on to trigger my feelings. And then at one point I will cry because I miss my son, I miss things like that. If I don't know somebody, I have no past with them. Then how can I cry by thinking about them? I cannot. I have nothing to hang on to. So if someone remembers Allah in private and cries, what should you do to cry? What should you do to cry? If I thought about my sins and how I did wrong, I can cry. But I can't just think of Allah. The other thing, uh, think of Allah and cry. The other thing is this. This hadith says, remember, someone sits and remembers Allah. A believer, a true believer, does not forget Allah. When you're walking down the street and uh, you can steal money, but you don't steal it, why don't you do that? Well, it's simple. Because you are in constant awareness with Allah. Being aware of Allah is something we do day in, day out, throughout the day. 
Allah did not order us to stay somewhere. Subhanallah, 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 subhanallah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, akbar. All these are nonsense. The rewards of them are over, super exaggerated. Uh, you, go, you sit and you say 100 times, subhanallah, you get this reward. <laughs> you get nothing. Because what Islam is here for is to turn the instruction into action. There is no amount of subhanallah that you do that will make it good for you on judgment day if your actions do not go along with your words. If someone claims to remember Allah, sits in some place and remember Allah in private until you cry, and then when you go out you are an evil person, you are a miserable person, you backbite, you do this and you do that, then you are a liar by any stretch, you are a liar. And how can a person with such iman, a, a strong belief, go throughout a whole day forgetting Allah and then sit at home and remembering it? And why should Allah reward this man for remembering him? What does, what does Allah get out of this? What does Allah gain? Doesn't Allah know what's inside that man's heart? You see, this statement, like the ones before it, do not make any sense. Even though this hadith narrative is reported by Bukhari, Muslim, Ahmed, and, and the whole shebang, it just doesn't mean a thing. But now there is a question that is, again, imposing itself. It's another question. Where does this shade of Allah come from? The idea, since it doesn't say it in the Quran, and the Prophet Muhammad or the Messenger of Allah Muhammad cannot say something out of his own hat and says, oh Allah told me this, on judgment day Allah knows one thing and one thing only. Alam takun ayati tutla'alik, weren't my ayat? If he's talking to us, the people of the Quran, it's the Quran. If he's talking to a Jew, it's the Torah. If he's talking to a Christian, it's what's in the Bible. Believe it or not, on judgment day, the Christians will be judged according to what it says in the Bible. And in the Bible, it prohibits the eating of pork. On judgment day, all those who ate pork will be held to accountability. Why did you eat? And they can't say, oh, I didn't know. You're a Christian for the God's sake. You're a Christian. And the, Jesus will do nothing to intercede for them or get them out of problem. So when Allah says, Alam takun ayati tutla alik, weren't my ayat, my part of my revelation that I sent to you, recited upon you, Allah will not expect you to say, oh, this one is in Bukhari. Oh, this one is in Hadith. Oh, this one that Sheikh said. No, you've got to answer with what is in the Quran or in the Torah or in the Gospel and things like that. So where do the idea of this shade come from? Well, if you go and take a small look in the Bible, and as I said before, over 80% of the Salafi Islam is in the Torah. <laughs> we are more Jewish than the Jewish themselves. But anyhow, let me read to you a few passages from the Bible so that you know a little bit of, you get an idea where this idea of shade comes from. Verse number one, and this is in the, uh, in the Psalms or Psalms, P S A L M S, in uh, Psalms or Psalms, and it's 36 or the Psalms. It depends on how you read, but anyhow, it's verse number one from the Psalms or Psalms or Psalms, number 36. Here they praise Allah. This is a singing process, and this is how they praise Allah. How good is your loving mercy, O oh God? The children of man take cover under the shade of your wings. Christians believe on Judgment Day, humanity, his children, which to them are Christians, will seek refuge under the wings of God. And obviously, uh, it could mean protection, it could mean many things. But here, we'll see later on. In verse, uh, at least the Bible here, gives hope to all mankind. Uh, unlike this human narrative, which only uh, isolates the belief believers only. Verse number 2, and this is in Ruth 02, and the verse 12, it reads like this, may the Lord, and this is the Bible, eh? may the Lord reward your work, and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Again, wings here could be literal wings, or hypothetical one example like oh you are under my wings meaning you are under the protection verse number three again it's psalms or psalms number 17 verse 8 it reads like this 
keep me as the apple of the eye. And that's why you have so many hadith. They say Rasulullah said, a salat is like the apple of my eyes. <laughs> but you know, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Oh, ho, now we're starting to see the wings. And remember, Abu Huraira, Kabul Ahbar, Abd uh, Ibn Munabbah, these people that are highly regarded in Salafi spheres were Jewish or students of Jewish rabbis. And these, uh, like Ibn Munabbah and Kabul Ahbar, these people were actually Jewish rabbis. But anyhow, who embraced Islam. And as you can see, how they can say such things, because they know them in, the, in their own uh, Torah, in their uh, Talmud, or the way the Jews believe. Verse number four, in Revelations four, verse from one and two. It reads, and here it's going to mention the throne in heaven. John, who is the fourth canonical Bible, you know, Matthew, Paul, and, uh, and here we've got John, is talking, and he says like this, after this, so this is the Apostle John, he says, after this, I looked, and therefore before me was a door standing open in heaven. John was uh, there sleeping and then he opens his eyes and he finds this door and it's opened into heaven, the sky is uh, high above. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Now verse number two, it reads, at once I was in the spirit. I, he no longer was a physique, so it's his spirit who climbed to the heavens and therefore before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, that someone is Allah. Doesn't this remind you of the Isra and the accession of the Prophet Muhammad? It's exactly the same thing. If I remove Paul and I put uh, the Prophet of Allah Muhammad, Muhammad, as they say it, is exactly the same narrative. Number five, it's again Psalms 91 verse 1. It reads, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, and here is the temple, or put it like this, the masjid, the mosques. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, Allah of course, shall rest under the shadow of the Almighty. And they are talking on judgment day. So you can see the concept of being in the shade or shadow of the good Lord on judgment day starts its root in the Bible and ends in our Islam in Bukhari and Muslim. In conclusion, my dear sisters and my brother, this surreal narrative is nothing but an unjust and untrue statement. Someone somewhere had lied this lie and attributed it to the messenger of Allah. Any person who studies the Quran will see that this hadith of the seven uh, on heaven and you know the shade of things like that is nothing but a total hoax. And that the messenger of Allah being a man educated and taught by Allah wouldn't say such crazy things because the messenger of Allah was the real, the physical implementations of the teachings of the Quran and it is impossible for him to say something that doesn't exist in the Quran. All what this narrative represents is what the men of religion in the days of old have invented. Someone has invented it. Remember before the sheikhs, they just invent something and they create a chain of narrators and it becomes authentic. They were the best people to know what names they put in the chain of narrators so that whatever they say is acceptable. And then they attributed it to the messenger of Allah. Bear in mind, again, my dear sisters and my brother and brothers, the sun, as dangerous as it is, as hot as it is, as incredibly gigantic as it is, on judgment day will cause people only to sweat, not burn them into pieces. Not, not, <laughs> it's just, it's going to make them sweat. This is a lie. There are no seven categories. There are no eight categories. Nobody, there is no shade on Judgment Day. Inshallah, in the long series of uh, when I speak about the life of the messengers and prophets from the Quran, and I start from the day Allah decided for Adam and before a little bit, and then until people go to Jannah, and Nar, uh, fire, and what happens on Judgment Day, until that moment comes in. I will leave you with these uh, small snippets about the lies that have been injected in Allah's religion. I pray to Allah to open our hearts to the true Islam of Al-Quran and always remember, 
Anyone who tells you the messenger of Allah said is a liar for it is a totally agreed rule amongst the sheikhs that any hadith narrative is only a transmission of the meanings of each man what each man understood from the man who told him before him when they say the messenger of Allah said they are not transmitting what the words of the messenger like the Quran when you say Allah says ahad, you are saying what Allah said the hadith is the opposite when someone tells you Rasulullah said the messenger of Allah said understand that what that person is saying is what has been transmitted to them by meaning nothing is real and that's why on judgment day the messenger of Allah will complain to Allah will accuse the Muslims that they have abandoned the Quran deliberately to anything else on judgment day there is no place for Bukhari Muslim and scholars on judgment day there is only one place and one place only for the mighty Quran stick to it you always are on the right path this is your brother Abdul Salam and I pray to Allah to bless you all and help us get to grip with our religion from the book that he descended to us Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah